All right. Good meeting again to everybody. Good to see you. See you here tonight. It's always a joy to gather together to study God's word and hear from Him. You know, as we're studying the book of Ezra, and it's been so enlightening to see how the Lord strengthened and sustained the work. And again, it's so important to remember, you know, these this work was something that the Lord initiated and the Lord fulfilled as He had promised His people. And uh, you know, and I think again here, unless the Lord is the one initiating it, unless the Lord is the one doing it, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, but I want to take a moment before we get started our study, and I uh, take a moment to pray for a few prayer requests I received tonight. And, uh, you know, there was some that were pretty urgent, and uh, I thought they were pretty, we should take a moment to pray for together as the body of Christ. Um, Sally Thompson, they usually, Sally and JR, they usually sit here in the front row, and uh, they're not here tonight, but their, um, their daughter Heidi, who lives in Twin Falls, is battling cancer she, uh, for the last four years. And she's having a very difficult time right now. So I want to pray for Sally and her daughter, Heidi. And um, and I guess, and also apparently Sally's attending to her mother's needs as well. Apparently uh, Sally's mother's not doing very well, needing, needing uh, constant assistance. So I want to pray for them as well. Um, I got an a, a email earlier for uh the Becker family, they don't attend here, but they are new to the area of Pocatello, and um, they're uh, facing some financial difficulties, so I want to pray for them, as well as Jeff and Christina Fadness. Uh, apparently, they um, were tested positive for COVID, and uh, so no indication doesn't tell us, you know, how bad they are feeling, that they're severely sick or not, but uh, uh, they're going to be in quarantine until the 13th. Uh, this month, and they're supposed to be uh, going on a trip. They have a scheduled trip to Colorado on the 15th. So we want wisdom for that. You know, as, you know though they're going to be in quarantine until the 13th, and I guess technically their quarantine will be over, but they're not sure how they're going to be feeling for a trip to Colorado. And then apparently some other other uh, domestic trips that they have planned as head. So they just want God's guidance, wisdom, and direction. And then I also want to pray for... Uh, Mrs. Hall's daughter, Mindy, too, as well. She's going through treatment every day, uh, you know, for uh, her condition as well. So I want to pray for Mindy. Let's take a moment and pray for these things. Father, I want to pray for the Thompson family. Lord, we just lift up Heidi to you. We pray that you stretch for the hand to heal her of this uh, cancer. Lord, we cry out to you. You are the great physician. And we just beseech you for your mercy upon her, upon Heidi, to heal her. And to just rebuke this illness from her body. We cry out to you for your healing touch. We also pray, Lord, for um, Sally, Lord. We pray you strengthen her. Her heart, I'm sure, is heavy for her daughter. Concerned for her future. As well as she is being um, the caretaker for her mother as well. And, and the, 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 their course. The responsibilities that has required of Sally right now. We just pray for your grace over Sally and uh, just to strengthen her hands. And, and I know her husband, JR, is his health challenges as well. So we just lift them up to you. May you bless them and keep them. May your face be upon them, Lord. We also want to pray for the Becker family. Lord, we pray provide for them in this time of need. Lord, you know their, their situation. We just beseech you provide for them. And, uh, Lord, just pray also for them to get established in a good uh, Bible teaching fellowship as well, Lord. They're, they're needing their, their church to be, church body to get connected with. We pray for that. Also, Father, I want to pray for the fadnesses, Lord. We thank you for them and, and the, the new direction you have in their lives, Lord, as they are stepping out to see where you are going to lead them and trusting that you have... Uh, um, further things to do, Lord, uh, further ministry. And Lord, as they're waiting upon you, we pray you continue to give them wisdom and understanding and direction for that. Also, Lord, we pray for healing, Lord, as they're um, battling COVID right now. 
Lord, it doesn't sound like they um, are having horrible symptoms, but Lord, we pray for your, your grace over them and that things don't get severe. As well, Lord, we pray for strength and sufficiency for the, the plans they have ahead, Lord, as they, they plan to go to Colorado here in a couple of weeks, as well as um, other trips as well to visit family and friends and other um, opportunities that you have available for them. Lord, we pray for your guidance, your wisdom and discernment, Lord, that you give them sound understanding. And bless that family, Lord. We thank you for them. Also, Father, I want to pray for Mindy. Lord, just pray you bless and keep her and heal her, Lord. We cry out to you for healing. Lord, draw her to yourself. Lord, open her eyes that she may see that you love her and you have a plan for her life. And uh, Lord, we look to you. Lord, we want to continue to pray for uh, Ron. Lord, again, we just rejoice in that he is home and doing great. He's doing better, at least, and uh, recovering. But Lord, we pray for continued recovery process, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you'd strengthen his, his body, his, his ability to assimilate the oxygen into his blood, Lord, that he wouldn't have to be dependent upon the oxygen uh, um, support for uh, much longer, Lord. We just pray for a miracle in his life. And we just thank you for the miracles you've already performed in his life and, and others, Lord. We thank you for like the um, Cameron, Lord, how, how you've healed him. And as well as uh, the Hollands, Lord, we thank you for their healing and others, Lord, who were sick recently. Lord, we just thank you for the, your grace upon these. And so, Lord, we look to you tonight as you would speak to us, reveal yourself to us, and it's in your name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, one more announcement. I was told by Gene to remind everybody, those of you who maybe signed up for Financial Peace University, to connect with him so he can walk with you getting registered. I guess, you know, you signed up on on maybe the paperwork, but there is a registration where you have to, I guess, develop a, uh, an account with uh, Financial Peace University, and he'd be happy to walk you through that. So if you want to call the church tomorrow, um, our phone number is on the bulletin, and uh, the, we can get you in contact with Gene Hodges, and he we can walk you through that as well. And if you haven't signed up yet, I'd encourage you to do that. We're starting next week on Tuesday night. That should be ex um, exciting to begin to develop some skills and disciplines on how to, you know, be financially wise. And I think that's a wise thing. I think a lot of the Proverbs address that. And so um, it would be a good opportunity to grow in that. Well, let's turn this evening to Ezra as we continue our study through the book of Ezra. And, uh, well, we just got a couple more weeks left here. And uh, so we'll be praying about where to go from here after this. And uh, whether we touch on Haggai or Zechariah or maybe some other, there's always all kinds of good book, good books. You can't go, can't go wrong when you study the Bible, really. <laughs> so got plenty of material to work with. Kenzie, why don't you just step up? She caught a, a cricket down here. <laughs> just let it go. Anyways, it'll hop around and be just fine. All right, Ezra chapter 8. So last week we touched on chapter 7 where we uh, had the declaration from Artaxerxes for Ezra to go and lead a group to Jerusalem to help in the process of teaching the people the Word of God. Uh, as the, the temple has now re been rebuilt, and worship has been established there, but there's a need for the people now to be discipled, be instructed to how to worship the Lord. And, and here we have this man, Ezra, the Lord appoints, and uh, a man whose heart has been touched by the Lord, who has, who has prepared his heart, prepared his heart to do the will of God, or to prepare his heart to seek the Word of God, to do the Word of God, and then to teach the Word of God. And so he is being commissioned by the king. Of course, we know also, as he would often refer to, that also the hand of God, the good hand of the Lord, or the hand of the Lord was on his life for the good. 
And we'll find that again tonight, references of that. God's hand be upon him, upon the situations ahead of him. And I think as we look at this, to understand that the hand of God in this is, is a is, is an expression of God's grace. When you talk about the hand of God at work in, in our lives, in the lives of somebody's, in somebody's life, it, it's an indication of God's grace at work. It's God's sufficiency, God's strength. And, you know, grace, or God's strength, I should put it that way, God's strength is something that we don't deserve. We don't deserve to have Him at work in our lives. And it, it's not something we can't earn. You know, it's not like, well, I've been a good boy today, Lord, so can you strengthen me? Um, I'm going to do better tomorrow, um, so when I get it right, will you strengthen me? Rather, it's quite the opposite way around. It's rather, Lord, I have been failing, I am struggling, and I need your strength to help me. I have fallen short. I need your grace. I need your strength, your sufficiency. And I find that so often we get it backwards. In, in the church, in the body of Christ, so often, like, you know, let's work on doing better, work on being stronger, work on performing. And yes, there is a sense of wanting and willing to do God's will, following the Lord. But we're told that, we're, yes, we're to work out our salvation, but it's Him who works within us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. I believe what, what's been indicated there is that we're to choose. We're to be willing. We have to make the choice. Lord, I want to work it out. I want to come and, and work things out. I want to do what's right. But, I, Lord, I need you, your strength, to help me to become what you intend for me to be. It's like you go to, do, you go to the workout center to work out. You know, you, you, of course, you can't work out unless you show up. You have to choose to show up. But rather than you come in there and, and muster up the strength to do, to work, to do the lifting, as I choose to show up, the Lord then strengthens me and gives me His sufficiency. He's okay, you're here. You've chosen to be here. I'm going to now empower you. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to strengthen you. My hands will be upon you to work through you to accomplish what I've called you to do. So it's for us to choose. God's not going to force his way into our lives. But it's choosing, yielding ourselves to the will of God, and then he works through us. And that's what we see here in the life of Ezra and the work that God was accomplishing through him. Ezra was choosing. He was choosing to seek the Lord. He was choosing to do the will of God. He was choosing to teach the word of God, and God was going to work. God's hand was upon him to do that through him. And so we're going to see a little more of that indication tonight. So let's take a look here. And to start out, it says, these are the heads of the father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. And so we're not going to read through all the names here. I'm not going to stumble and embarrass myself and try to attempt to go through these names. But I think some of the key things we want to keep in mind for the next 14 verses is that in this is about 12 there's about 12 major families listed. And it's probably each one representing, possibly representing one of the tribes of Israel. It's not indicated precisely, but it's fascinating. There's 12 families, 12 major families. It just, it just has the, the head of the family. As it says here, these are the heads of the fam, father's houses. And so names their father's houses and those who are registered with them, how many people. And it comes to approximately... Um, 1,496 men, and then plus women and children. So, you know, probably a couple thousand, uh, maybe probably closer to 3,000 people, maybe more, when you consider children as well. So probably about 3,000 people. And then later on, as we'll come, as we go after verse 14, pick up at verse 15, we'll find that there's some more that are added on as well with some Levites and Nethanim and other helpers in the house of the Lord. So, not a very large entourage comparatively to the first group that came under Zerubbabel and Joshua. But still, you could think about, you know, 3,000 people traveling through the wilderness. That's still a large group of people. 
I mean, that's it's quite a crowd. Um, it's not a small group, and especially when you consider there's women and children included. So pick it up in verse 15. It says, Now I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava. And we camped there for three days. And I looked among the people and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. So he camps at Ahava, approximately nine days' travel. He traveled about nine days. We'll find that to leave this area, this camp, at 12 days after, 12 days into the month. He left at the first day of the month from um, Babylon to make his way to Jerusalem. And he's going to leave on the 12th day of the month, and they're going to stay there for three days. So probably about nine-day travel, nine days they, you know, until they came to this point. But he gets to sit here at Ahava, and he takes an inventory of who's there, and he notices one particular situation. He looks at the, the people that are there, and he takes inventory of them as well as the priests. But he found none of the sons of Levi there. Now, there's a distinction between the priests and the Levites. The priests were those who served in the offerings and, you know, offering of uh, incense during the hour of prayer, the offerings of the sacrifices for sin or, or um, commitment or, or reconciliation or, you know, all these fellowship offerings, all the various offerings that were required um, daily throughout the day, um, they were performed by the priesthood. Now the Levites, though they were, all, though the the priests were from the Levi um, line of Levi, the tribe of Levi, but they were direct descendants of Aaron. But then there were the Levites, and the Levites as a whole were those who were to help in the responsibilities of the upkeep of the temple. These are people kind of help maybe cleaning the utensils, um, helping with the maintenance doing some of the, you know, the, the other responsibilities of the temple. You, know, you might consider maybe some the maintenance people, the janitors and other types of people. And which I think I find this fascinating is he takes the inventory, he finds there's no Levites amongst them. And notice here, verse 16, Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, and Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jared, and Elnathan as well. So a couple of Elnathans there as well as a Nathan and Zechariah and Meshulam. These were leaders. And as well as also for Joyrib and El, another Elnathan, men of understanding. So he asked these guys who were amongst those who had come with them. He, inquired, he asked these guys to come. And he commissions them. And I gave them, he says, verse 17, he gave them the command. So they gave them the command for Edu, the chief man of the place in Casiphia. And I told them that they should say to Edu and his brethren, the Nethanim, at the place of Casiphia, that they should bring us servants for the house of our God. So he pauses his journey. He's, he's stepping out. They're getting ready to go, but he takes a halt. He realizes, wait, we don't have any Levites or Nethanim with us. Now, these Nethanim, these were guys that they were not typically from the tribes of Israel. But these were people appointed under, the, under David's reign to kind of help in, in some of the menial jobs in the temple. And the word Nethanim actually means given. So these guys are kind of given to help. I guess that's where the term came from. In Hebrew, it means given. So these guys were given to help in the work of the upkeep of the temple. But again, one very important thing is seeing that as they're going to help in the work in the temple... Ezra realizes we can't go forward until we have these guys. These guys are important. They're important to go forward. And my people will say, well, those are just, you know, these guys just help with the janitorial work or the maintenance work or the, the other type of stuff, the, the menial jobs you might refer to. But the truth is, every part, every, every job is important. It's all important. And it's so important for us to realize in the body of Christ that every part of the body is important. I think of my own body, my physical body. I, I, I appreciate every member of my body. I appreciate every digit I have in my hands, even my little pinky. 
I appreciate that. I mean, it would, it would affect me if I didn't have my pinky. Um, I appreciate my little pinky toe. I appreciate every part of my body. It all has a very important function for my body to perform the way it should. And so it goes with the body of Christ, the church. Every part of the body is important. And some may say, well, you know, yeah, but my, what I'm doing or, or maybe what I can do, maybe. You may think, well, I can only do this or that, and it really isn't that important, so I shouldn't bother doing it. I'd really encourage you, you know, to be praying how the Lord may use you. If you're not involved in some place in the body of Christ, I'd really encourage you to be praying how the Lord may want to use you. And I appreciate those of you who are involved. I mean, those who help with greeting on Sunday mornings. I appreciate that I come to the door and I'm greeted with a happy smile and an encouraging word and just friendly faces. And, and I'm encouraged that I don't have to stand there, you know, because I couldn't do that and do everything else that I, you know, I need to do. Um, and I'm appreciative of the sound people. I'm appreciative of the people who do the worship. Each person, every place has its, each, each function has its place. Those who come and help the cleaning, I appreciate it of that. Um, every part is so valid. I'm reminded in the book of Acts, in chapter 6, you might recall the story. As a church of believers, the body of Christ, as the church was growing, the needs were also growing with it. And there came a point where there was some challenges occurring as there were growth pains amongst the body of Christ. There were some needs arising. And it was brought to the attention of the apostles. We find in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, which is a good thing, and I like the idea of multiplying. <laughs> it was just adding. It was multiplying. It was growing considerably. You know, it was... It's exciting things are happening. The body of Christ is growing. Excitement. But it says, in the midst of this, there rose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now, Hellenists were, these were Jews, but they practiced the, the Grecian lifestyle. And so, to a Jew, a, a person that was a dedicated Jew, or might we call a, um, a traditional Jew, or, you know, the, someone who was hardcore Jew, they, they would look down upon a Greek-practicing Jew, someone who kind of practiced the Grecian lifestyle and weren't following all the kosher laws. And so they would be looked down upon. And so there arose a division between the Hebrew and the Hellenists because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So apparently there was a number of widows in the church body. And you know, the Bible talks about how Paul wrote to Timothy to how the, the church should support widows who were, who were legitimate widows to a certain age and, and served to a certain point. They should be supported. And so there was apparently a number of these widows within the body of Christ, and they were receiving some distribution, some financial assistance, some food regularly. But apparently the Hebrew, the Hebrew practicing widows were getting preferred above the Hellenist practicing widows. And so there was like, hey, this isn't fair. And so there was this dispute occurring. And so the 12 12 apostles were summoned. And the multitude of the disciples, they said to them, and they said to the multitude, um, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from amongst you seven men of good reputation. So first of all, they said, okay, it's not good for us. The apostle says, it's not good for us to go and serve tables. They say, okay, these guys are high-minded. There's two, they're, two, they're above this. They don't want to go serve tables. But notice here what they, who they're looking for to serve these tables. They don't look at, like, go just find anybody who's willing to serve a table and help with this distribution. It says, find people, seek out from amongst you seven men of good reputation. These people with good reputation, these weren't just any average person you, know, you could find full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. These were just, you know, menial Christians or believers. These were people that were mature in their relationship with the Lord. So this wasn't just a small thing. They saw it. They said, these people to do this, take on this responsibility, they had to be mature in the Lord. Because you can see here what this is causing. This is 
create division in the body. And therefore, they understood the need for mature people to be involved in the ministry there because the deal with the division that was occurring. And so to understand that, you know, being involved with anything in, the, in ministry is not something looked down upon as just a menial thing. It's, there, there, there should be a level of, of relationship with the Lord, a commitment. But here we see that there was, the apostles understood where they needed to be, because it says, but we will give ourselves continually to the prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they understood their call was to prepare themselves through prayer and studying God's word, because if, they are, if they're out serving the tables, they couldn't prepare the message, the Bible studies, and praying for the body of Christ, interceding for the, the work of the, of the Lord in the body. And so they saw this as drawing, taking them away from what they were called to do. And so therefore, they says, okay, we need to appoint someone to handle this so that we can do what we're supposed to do, because this is what they were supposed to do. You know, it's like my, my, my thumb decides it wants to be a nose. You know, it may look pretty silly. It's not what it's designed to be. You know, though my thumb may want to be a nose, like I want to be on the forefront. I want to be on the face. I want to be uh, seen. But it's not what it's designed to be. So the issue is not so much one being better than the other, but it's about being what God has called you to be, what God has created you to be. And that's the case here is, these guys, they says, hey, we need to find people that are mature, that are have grown in the relationship with the Lord, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, a good reputation, to handle this responsibility so that we can do what the Lord has called us to do. And notice here, and the same pleased the whole multitude. And you notice here they chose seven people, Stephen, man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, which is fascinating. We'll find these two guys later on. The Lord uses them in other areas as well. Procanus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, as well as uh, he was a proselyte from Antioch, which is fascinating. These were all Greeks. They called guys that were Greek to handle this, whom they set before the apostles, and they prayed and they laid hands on them. And the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So because they followed this pattern of realizing, hey, there was a certain function. Everyone had a certain place. The byproduct was the church grew even more. It was able to expand. It was able to handle. See, if the, if the, if the apostles decided, okay, well, we've got to take care of this. So they left preparing themselves spiritually through studying God's word and, and left off the praying, which I believe is exactly what Satan wanted to happen. It would have quenched the work. But because they understood the need to expand, to appoint other people to this work so they continue to do what God was calling them to do, it allowed things to expand a little more. And that's, a, and that's how the body, of, God, uh, the body of, of the church, the body of Christ works. Is, as, as the churches grow and the need for other people to be raised up and be appointed these positions to accommodate those needs. And so again, I want to encourage you. you know, be prayerful. How will I want to use you? I remember years ago, when the Lord first called me to ministry, I remember going to lunch with a friend of mine who was, uh, he, he led a home fellowship group I was attending, kind of a mentor to me, and, he, and we were just having lunch and talking and stuff, and he finally looked at me and said, you know, have you ever considered doing youth ministry? I said, no. He said, why don't you pray about it? Okay. I mean, that's just all about all it was. He didn't say, hey, God might be called you today. He just, just pray about it. So I started praying about it. Next Sunday in the bulletin, there was an announcement for youth ministry helpers. I'm like, well, check it out. And I showed up and started participating in youth ministry and eventually he became very involved in youth ministry. And in fact, it was while I was sitting in youth ministry, I, was sitting, I remember one day I was sitting in the youth group as a helper and, and a leader in the youth group. And while I was sitting there, the Lord spoke to me one day and he says, I want, I want you to go to Bible college. So I inquired about that and found out the Bible college and started preparing about that. And then, and then shortly after, before I went, the Lord said, Another day, he goes, I'm going to use you in Costa Mesa to help with, with the youth group. I'm thinking, what? Because this time I was actually serving a church in San Diego. I'd never been to Costa Mesa. I'd never been out there. I, you know, I'd seen Chuck Smith once. I just heard stories of him. I didn't know who he was. And 
here I'm this little guy helping out with the youth ministry. But Lord spoke to me one day as I was helping out there. He says, I want to use you in Costa Mesa. I'm thinking, well, Lord, if that's from you, then so be it. You know, make it happen. So I ended up going to Bible college there in Riverside County, which happens to be an hour and a half away from where Costa Mesa is at. But I going to Bible college there. Finished the Bible college, the Lord revealed to me my need to further studies. And so I ended up moving to Costa Mesa where they had a pastoral training school. And I'm going to Costa Mesa to train there. And while I was there, I it, you know, decided, well, well, how about the youth ministry? Because one of the responsibilities of going to the school is you had to get involved in ministry. I think, well, I've done youth ministry before. I'll do it. So I went, checked out the youth ministry, started helping out there. And one day I'm sitting there realizing, here I am at Costa Mesa. How about the youth ministry? I'm like, wow, <laughs> just like that. You know, it wasn't like I planned it out, like, okay, here's how I'm going to get to Costa Mesa to help with the youth ministry. It's just like the Lord just kind of threw things, put me there. But it's just, you know, stepping out, making steps, and, and making those things, you know, the Lord begins to lead and direct us in our lives and placing us where we want to be, where he wants us to be, I'm sorry, placing us where he wants us to be. And so we see here, in our text, as Ezra looks at the, the groups, he sees that there's the regular pe- the people that come along to help, um, you know, just to come move to, to Jerusalem. But then there's the priests, but there's a lack of the Nethanim and the Levites. And so he takes a moment, pauses before he moves forward and says, hey, we need these men. These are important men to this work. And so he sends these others to these leaders and these people of understanding to go and find this man, Edu, and say, hey, we want you to put together a team of Levites and Nethanim to come with us. And so we find here, notice here, verse 18. Then by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding. Isn't that glorious? Because God's hand was upon this work. God was doing this. This was God doing it. And that's what's, in, you know, what we need to be understanding, seeking is, Lord, what is it you're doing here? We need God's strength to accomplish the work here, to be building up and establishing his work. And so the Lord worked in and through this situation and, and provided the sufficiency. As I pointed out again, I believe the sufficiency of the Lord is, you know, the hand of God is, is his sufficiency at work in our lives. I'm reminded of Apostle Paul. He's a man used mightily by the Lord. You might think, okay, this guy, you know, he was just so successful. He, would, he had a lot of credentials, well learned. I mean, if anybody had a pedigree that would give him credentials to get to heaven, it would have been Paul. Of course, he would say that all these things that count as rubbish for the excellency of Christ. But one thing he did boast it in, what he did boast in was not his strength, but there was the strength of his God at work in and through him. For he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. He says, but I labored more abundantly than they all. So his grace, his grace was upon me, not in vain. He just, I didn't, I wasn't just passive in my relationship with the Lord. But because of his strength that was at work in my life, his grace at work in my life, I labor more abundantly than everyone else. He's referring to the other apostles. I labor more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And we consider all that was accomplished in the life of Apostle Paul. I mean, that he did. He, he accomplished quite a bit. I mean, you think of all the churches that were planted through this man. All the scriptures are written. He wrote far more uh, epistles and letters than any other apostle. I mean, the things that were accomplished through this one man is phenomenal. But he would say, it's not because of me, but it was the grace of God, the strength of God at work within me. His hand was upon me to accomplish what was needed. Again, in 2 Corinthians twelve nine, he would say, and he, he said to me, we're into Paul, because Paul, he was inquiring, inquiring of the Lord concerning this trial he was going through, this messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him, this thorn in the flesh. And he said, the Lord replied to me that my grace 
is sufficient for you. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. In your weakness. Therefore, he says, most gladly then I most, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, it's not about our sufficiency, our strength to accomplish the will of God, but it's God's strength upon us, his grace upon us to accomplish the work. And so here, uh, Ezra, he doesn't boast in the fact, well, I had letters from Artaxerxes to tell, tell these guys to come help me. I, I wasn't the high priest. Was, it was because I was the high priest. They gave me the authority to commission these guys. He understood that it was the grace of God to accomplish this work. And for you and me, as we go day by day, facing the, the challenges, the circumstances of our lives, we might be facing situations where we feel weak, we feel discouraged, disheartened, and we feel like, what is God doing? Is he letting us down? Why am I going through this trial? Why do I feel so, you know, insufficient? And as Apostle Paul would say, it's so that the grace of God, his sufficiency may rest upon us. His strength may be made perfect through us. You see, so often we're apt to rely on our own sufficiency. I know I do that. I feel like I'm pretty sufficient, pretty smart, maybe pretty, you know, driven. And I find myself oftentimes got my plans, got my purposes, I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to get done, and, and I'll find myself smack against the wall. I'm like, whoa, what happened there? What happened, Lord? Weren't you in this? He goes, no. You weren't waiting on me. You got ahead of me. You were trusting your strength and not mine. And he'd wake me up and say, now, why don't you wait upon me and trust in my strength? And that's what we find here also, one other thing that Ezra did wisely. As we go on here, skip it ahead to verse 21. It says, Then I proclaimed a fast. I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek him, to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For he says, I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of the soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Because we, had because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So, apparently Ezra was boasting in his guy. He's telling the king, Xerxes, yeah, my God is so good, and he's, he's, he's sufficient. He's great. He's awesome. When his hand is upon you, he can't, nothing can, you know, he can't be stopped. He's probably talking up as God so good, which is great. But then he, you know, because he's talking about his God, how powerful he was, he realized, wait a second, he'd be kind of contradictory. Now say, oh, by the way, can you send me some horsemen, some, uh, you know, uh, footmen to come along and protect us while we go on this journey that God has called us to? Because he felt like, well, I was just talking how good my God is and how strong he is and how capable he is to help those whose hand is upon him, his, his sufficiency to help us. Um, but I need sufficiency from you now. And so he, he felt embarrassed to ask the king for help. And so, but notice here, he proclaims a fast to seek the Lord. But for two reasons. One, for protection. But also, it says, so that we might seek him for the right way for us to go. To seek the Lord for direction. And I think that's a wise, wise decision to make in our lives. Again, as I point out, I'm so apt to find myself getting ahead of the Lord. You know, leaning on my own understanding. Trusting in my own self. Instead of seeking the Lord. Acknowledging Him. And seeking first His kingdom. 
I think of the apostles again in the book of Acts. You might recall the situation. Peter, got to love Peter. You learn a lot from him. And I think we all can relate to him in many ways. Here's a man used so mighty by the Lord, but yet we see also a lot of his, his shortcomings. And, you know, Peter here, the first chapter of Acts, he, recall, he quotes from Scripture. He acknowledges the Word of God. And in reference to Judas, Judas Iscariot, who died, had killed himself because of condemnation, because he betrayed the Lord. So referring to the fact that now there was only 11 apostles, and what, sensing that there should be a 12, because that's what the Lord had established originally, 12 apostles, and 12 is the number of government. So that would be appropriate to have a 12th one. So um, Peter says, For it is written in the book of the Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, referring to Judas, he's done with, but let another take his office, he, as he quotes from the Psalms. So Peter goes on to say, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John to this day, when he was taken up from us, one um, of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So he's referring to, we need to appoint another apostle. And he says, okay, we've got we to gotta choose from one of these guys that's been with us from the very beginning, who saw Jesus, you know, sat under him, and also saw his resurrection. So from these men, we, need, we should choose someone. And so they proposed two. They called Joseph, or they, they took, chose Joseph, who was called Barsabbas, and also was surnamed Justice, and also this guy Matthias. So they chose two guys that fit this definition or this uh, um, these credentials. And so they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in the ministry and the apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And so they said, Lord, here's two men. Choose which one do you want. Or you got two choices, Matthias or Justice, basically. And so then they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and so he was numbered amongst the 11 apostles and became the 12. Which, possibly that might have been what the Lord chose. One thing, though, I had to argue with about, though, is we don't read about Matthias anymore after this. Going through the book of Acts, he's never mentioned again, ever. We read about the other apostles, but Matthias is never mentioned again. It led me to wonder, did the Lord really choose? You know, sometimes I think we, we kind of approach the Lord that way. Lord, here's the choices. You've got A or B. Which one do you want? Instead of, I think the Lord say, I got C over here. He's got a whole other plan. And so often, I think we limit the Lord, what he wants to do. Lord, here's what I, here's what I suggest you do. Here's your op options of how you can make this work. And the Lord says, well, wait a second, I got a better plan. How about plan C? And I found more and more my relationship with the Lord that he has a better plan, far better plan than what I have in mind. In fact, I'd have to say, I think the Lord had somebody else in mind because we know what, skip it ahead to chapter 9 of Acts. We see the Lord stop one particular person upon the road of Damascus, Saul of Tarsus. And we find that the Lord calls him an apostle, appoints him to be an apostle, and sends him to the Gentiles. So in my reading of the, of the book of Acts, it would have seemed like the Lord had someone else in mind, Apostle Paul, as he would later on take upon himself that title. But not himself, he would say that the Lord has made me an apostle. And so it seemed like Apostle Paul was the one that the Lord had called. In fact, the Lord himself called him and stopped on the road to Damascus, knocked off his horse, blinded him, and then anointed him as the next apostle. Which leads me to believe, again, or just see this example, how so often, kind of like Peter, where we kind of get ahead of the Lord. Lord, we've got to get this thing accomplished. We've got to fill this office. We've got to get this thing happening. So, Lord, here's two options for you. Which one do you want? And we get ourselves ahead of the Lord. Instead of waiting on the Lord, Lord, what is it you want to do? I'm going to wait upon you until you show us what it is you want to do. 
So you show us the way we should go. And I think that's a very important practice that we should be, develop in our relationship with him, is waiting on him, seeking him, trusting him to show us. And we see that the Lord here answers them in our, in our text. As it says, verse 23, So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayers. So they entreated the Lord, and he answered him, and he gave them direction. And so they notice here, they, but he does take some practical steps. We found before that, the, that they were given quite a bit of gold and, and, well, and, and precious mater- things to bring with them. So they, they, they had a lot of money with them. It was given by the king, his offerings, as well as other um, important instruments for the temple. And so here we find that Ezra takes some precautions as well. So he says here, it says, I separated 12 of the leaders of the priests, Sherebiah and Hashabiah, Hashabiah, as well as 10 other of their brethren with them. So he takes these 12 priests and he weighed out to them the silver and gold and articles the offerings for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and the princes and all Israel had pre, um, that they were present had offered, and I weighed unto their, and I weighed into their hand six hundred and fifty talents of silver, silver articles weighing one hundred talents, one hundred talents of gold, and uh, twenty gold basins worth a thousand drachmas, and two vessels of fine polished bro, uh, bronze which was just as precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord. The articles are also holy also, and the silver and the gold are free will offerings to the Lord God of your fathers. So watch and keep them until, you, until we weigh them before the leaders and the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers, houses of Israel and Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So, he commissions these priests. He says, okay, here, he gives each of these 12 priests um, a portion of this possession so that way it's dispersed, so that way you know, if one of the guys attack, they don't lose everything. And he, and he um, commissions them to oversee these things. But I, I, I like here what he says about these. First of all, he says to these men, and these are priests, he says to them, you are holy. You are holy to the Lord. So you are set apart to the Lord. First of all, you, have, you are called by the Lord. You are commissioned by the Lord. You are men of God, people of God. Moreover, he says, the things that you're, that you're being given, these are holy vessels. These articles are holy. Some of them were used specifically for the temple. And the silver and the gold are free will offerings to the Lord God of your fathers. So he's pointing out, hey, these things have eternal significance. You yourself are set apart to the Lord. You're holy unto the Lord. The articles that, you're, that I'm giving to you are holy to the Lord. And the, the, the money that you have, it, though it's gold and silver and it's monetary, it's, it's a physical possession, yet it has eternal significance because it's an offering unto the Lord your God, the God of your fathers. And I think it's important for us to grasp how significant this is, the way he says it this way. See, he's trying to com- communicate that this, this, is, this is a work of God. You are God's people. You are commissioned by the Lord. You're a holy people. You're priests who are called a specific duty for the Lord. And these articles are a specific purpose for the Lord. This money has a specific purpose to worship the Lord with. It's all precious to the Lord. Not that the Lord needs it, but it's all to honor Him. And the reason I want to emphasize that is because, you see, the same applies to you and to me. I say, well, what do you mean? What do you mean the same applies to us? We're not priests, are we? Well, we are. You are. I am. We are priests. We're told that we are priests. We're part of the priesthood. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
you are. It says here specifically that you are a royal priesthood. You're a holy priesthood. You are holy unto the Lord. Do you realize that? You are holy unto the Lord. So at times maybe you may not feel that way, but that's the way the Lord sees you. You are holy to him. Your life is set apart unto him. And that you are to offer up sacrifice is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Well, what sacrifices would that be? What sacrifices then would we be offering? One of them we're told in, first, in Romans chapter 12, 1, the Apostle Paul says here in Romans 12, 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see, realizing that your life is set apart unto the Lord, and therefore by you living a life, honoring the Lord, our sacrifices that we bring an animal and offer it on an altar, but rather our lives. Living our lives day by day as a sacrifice to the Lord. But you see, the Lord is given to you and to me, just like these men were given a precious commodity, utensils for the, the temple to carry as they traveled from Babylon to Jerusalem or gave, given money to be offered a sacrifice, the Lord has also given to you. He's given it to me. He's given to us something also to offer to him that we possess and that we should hold precious unto the Lord. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, referring to our bodies, our physical bodies referred to an earthen vessel. If the excellence of the power of God it may not be of us, but, uh, but of him. That the excellence of the power of God be on us. You see, God has put his spirit upon you, in you. We possess God's spirit within us. And that's the holy treasure that we have. And as we go day by day or through our lives, that we would treasure that. This is holy unto the Lord. His Holy Spirit is precious unto him. He's entrusted his spirit into our lives and we're to carry it as something precious. To not dismiss it as something common. I love as, Paul, as Peter, Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.9. Again, addressing the fact that we are a priesthood. He addresses how it is that we could how we can carry this precious commodity, the Holy Spirit that which we possess, how we can carry it in a way that would not allow the enemy to take it from us. You see, that was the concern for, the, for Ezra and the men who, and women who were traveling from Babylon to Jerusalem. Is they were concerned that, that the enemy would come and, and rip, rob them of that precious commodity, of that holy commodity, the, those temple instruments or the, the finances that were used to the offering, they were wanted to protect it and keep it so that it wouldn't be ripped off. You see, the same goes for your life and for my life. Satan was to come and rob you of those precious treasures that the Lord has given to you. The holiness that the Lord has bestowed upon you. Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who God, or who has not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, he says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. See, as we sojourn, just like those people were sojourning from Babylon to Jerusalem, they're being called out of that life of darkness in Babylon now, being brought to Jerusalem where they're going to be, again, returning to worship the Lord, to the temple, and being rebuilt up and instructed in things of the Lord, to grow in their relationship with the Lord, being instructed in following the Lord. As they're sojourners in that, that's this call of God as they're sojourning through, to not allow the enemy rip them off, as, as Ezra says. Don't, you know, protect these things until you get to Jerusalem and we, we, get, we 
and give them back. So the same, Peter would, would, would uh, beg us. He says, hey, don't let the enemy rip you off of those precious commodities that you have, that purity of the Holy Spirit in your life, that we would not dismiss it as something common, but rather seeing that this is a precious treasure. This relationship we have with God is something precious, precious something to be desired, something to be beheld, something to protect, not to allow the enemy rip us off. And so, again, I love how, again, Ezra exhorted them to preserve. Preserve is because they're called, they're holy, they're set apart to the Lord, and the things they have been given are precious to the Lord. They're holy and set apart. And therefore, the same for you and for me. Our lives, we're no longer common people in a sense. We're precious people. We are God's children. We are God's children. And may we live that way, enjoy, enjoy being God's children, live such a way that we would preserve this relationship that God has given to us. And so we read here, going on verse 31, Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day, on the first month, to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God, again referring to God's sufficiency, was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from the ambush along the road. So they experienced attacks. It wasn't that they didn't experience it, but yet the hand of God was upon them to protect them from those attacks. And the Lord delivered them. God's strength was upon them. His grace was sufficient for them. And so it says that we came to Jerusalem and stayed there for three days. And now on the fourth day, the, the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of our God. By the hand of Mermoth, the son of Uriah, the priest. And with him was Eliezer, the son of Phinehas. And with them were the Levites, and Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadab, Noadiah, the son of ben, uh, Benui. And with the number, and we weighed of everything. So notice it was all weighed in. It was all restored, all maintained. It was all preserved and, and weighed in there in Jerusalem. And all the weight was written down at that time. So again, just notice here the care and the protection and how they, you know, again, here we see Ezra and still in the hearts of these men how to, to protect this, these things that were precious to the Lord. And so the children of those who had been carried away captive, who had come from the captivity, the offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel. So here they are, those who have been carried captive. Now they've returned and now they're offering and worshiping the Lord with their offerings there at the temple. And what a, just a glorious opportunity that must have been. Exciting to be there at the temple. He offered 12 bulls for all Israel and 96 rams, seven, uh, 77 lambs and 12 male goats as a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. And they delivered the king's orders to the king's satraps, the governors in the region beyond the river. And so they gave support to the people. In the house of God. And so again, they, they gave the orders that the king Xerxes had commissioned to the, the governors there on the other side of the river to, hey, you know, give these guys support for my treasury to support the work. And we see that the Lord was behind this and establishing and providing for the needs. And so the same for you and for me. As the Lord's hand is upon us, that we find ourselves resting in and looking to the Lord, resting in His provision, resting in His strength, looking to Him for His guidance and direction for our lives, not presuming upon ourselves, but rather seeking Him first, His kingdom and His righteousness. Let's pray. So, Lord, we thank You. Lord, we thank You for this example that we find in the life of Ezra. As You demonstrated in His life, your sufficiency. As you called him and led him, protected him, provided for him. And so, we, Lord, we the same for us. Lord, we look to you. Lord, as you would call us for certain purposes in, in our, 
our lives, Lord, wherever it may be, Lord, whether it be in our families, in the workplace, in this community, or here at the church itself, Lord, amongst the body. Lord, that you would be showing us those areas where you want to use us. And Lord, may we find your strength and your sufficiency to accomplish that work. Lord, we look to you as you are our God. And may we find your hand upon us for good, your strength, your sufficiency upon us to accomplish the work that you desire to do in and through us. Lord, because there's no greater joy to be yoked up with you. There's no greater fulfillment than to have your spirit working in and through us because we were created by you and for you. And so, Lord, I pray you just touch the hearts of my brothers and sisters tonight. May they experience, may they taste and see the goodness of you at work in their lives. And, Lord, those who you have called, Lord, I thank you for so many who've been involved in helping them here as well as maybe at their jobs or in their communities or their families, Lord, may they find your strength and sufficiency in everything that you've called them to do. May they find your sufficiency in all that they labor, Lord. They find that you are there, your hand upon them for good, to do what you want to do in and through them. And we worship you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for the last song, please.